When we were first introduced to the internet and the various platforms, as they say, Facebook, Twitter, this or that, and people could post their faces up or stories or incidents in their lives or even what they're eating, we were warned by the professionals, remember, whatever you put up, lasts forever. Now, of course, we don't know what that means, but some of our young people have found out what that means, and some mature adults have found out what that means. Once it's up, people see it forever. Once it's up and posted, anywhere around the world, someone can find it. Gets a little embarrassing when one posts something that is embarrassing or inappropriate and it comes up to haunt the person. We've seen that with politicians. Regrettably, we've seen that with kids. And it's reminiscent of today's scripture. What gets posted, what gets written, lasts forever. This story of Abraham is part of the oral tradition of the Hebrews, very significant. If we had a date, Abraham, 1850 BC. That's when he left his area of Ur, Mesopotamia, and traveled toward the land of promise, always inspired by God. Wasn't there, so there are various ways you can interpret how he heard God. Did he hear it in his ears, in his heart, in his prayers? The voice of God come? I, I don't know. But the tradition became so strong in the lives of the Jews that they passed it on for centuries, knowing that what was written by those who first started writing these stories would last forever. And of course, those stories had to be passed on orally until they were actually written down. And we give that to the credit of Solomon with the temple, trying to bring all the oral traditions together around the year 1000. So for a thousand years, these traditions weren't written, but they were alive. And they were passed down and passed down and passed down to the point where now we know what was written will last forever. So we have a story of this Abraham character. He's called the father of our faith, father of the Judeo-Christian tradition. He comes out of a pagan area, inspired by God to go toward the promised land. Long story short, he gets there. Now he's an old man. He and his wife Sarah have no children. Not a good description of a family in those days. To be without a child in those days meant something was wrong. You hurt God, you offended God, you did something incorrect. So it was looked upon almost like a burden. Without kids, you don't pass your heritage on and all the logic that goes with that. So finally, again, long story short, God promises him a kid. And in their old age, Sarah and Abraham conceive and bear a child, and they name him Smiley, Isaac. Go back to the scriptures, you'll find out why. So they name the kid Isaac, and they're proud of him. Just think, Abraham knows that this is going to be my inheritance. This kid's going to bring my name into the future. And I depend on this kid and his family to be. Well, push comes to shove. Maybe it's all of us do this, but God maybe questioned himself. God forbid, excuse me if that wasn't the case. But God questions the faith that Abraham had in God, the faith and the trust that Abraham had in God. And there we can identify. We can identify with Abraham. How much do we really trust God? How much do we really put our whole heart and soul behind God when we pray to him. Do we really believe he hears us 
and answers us. Okay. So to test that, and that's how the scriptures formulate it, he says to Abraham, uh, Abraham, you, you know that great kid you have, Isaac? Yeah. Th that wonderful kid that you couldn't wait to have with Sarah? Yeah. Th he's the, the joy of your life? Yeah. The only son you have? Yeah. I want him back. I want him back as a sacrifice. And he does that. He prepares to bring his kid to the mountain that God pointed out as a sacrifice. Little background. During that time in history, child sacrifice was common. Life sacrifice were common. This behavior changes that whole philosophy and theology regarding the Jewish practice of emulation of a son or daughter, of a child, of the firstborn. It changes after this. The Hebrews no longer will practice sacrifice of a child. But the pagans did, and there were some times in the course of Jewish history that some of the kings who weren't too stable also practiced it. Great disgrace on the Jewish people. So, okay, Abraham says to God, okay, you say so, here I am. And he brings the kid to the mountain, lays out the wood, and as he's ready to sacrifice the kid, destroy the kid, the love of his life besides his wife, the angel of the Lord stops him and says, nah, stop. Now God knows how much you love him. Wouldn't you love that? Wouldn't you love to hear God knows how much you love him, how much you trust him? Well, well, when we live a life of faith and we practice it, we may not hear it in our ears, but we definitely hear it in our hearts and in our prayer. So as a result, the kid is not sacrificed. They sacrifice an animal, and the, and the gift to God is consumed as an animal, no longer human sacrifice. Now, when the scriptures of the New Testament are written, huh, could you imagine the authors remembering that? And don't forget, the scriptures of the Gospels are written after the Gospel, after the history happened. And the authors go back to this sacred event in their Judeo-Christian history. And, and Mark is so thrilled that he's able to capture the past and present it to the present. He doesn't go to the cross yet. That will come in Mark's Gospel. But he stops on another mountain, a mountain to which Jesus brings Peter, James, and John, his three best buddies, we think. And there the unbelievable happens. He's transfigured before them. There's no word that captures it. There's no word that really can capture what happened. His face was as bright as the sun. His clothes became whiter than any bleacher could make them. And things were, like, outstanding. Could you just imagine? Peter, James, and John were shaking in their boots. And Peter says, Oh, I'm glad we're here because as he's talking he realizes Jesus is talking to someone else. He's talking to Elijah, the great prophet, who will usher in the second coming. He's, he's talking to Moses, the founder of their faith, the covenant. I mean, he must have been out of his mind, realizing this is Moses and Elijah who died centuries ago, and Jesus is chatting with them. Think of what goes on inside the hearts of the disciples. The, and, and the author says that they didn't know what they were talking about. They were so frightened. But he says, I'm glad I'm here, Peter says. Peter always speaks up for you and me. You know, he shoots from the hip. And it's not always straightforward and not always clear. But he speaks from the hip. I'm so glad we're here, Jesus. I'm going to set up a booth for you and Elijah and Moses. And they'll have this great picnic on the mountainside. 
He hardly knew what he was saying. And the, and the, and the summation of it, God speaking to you and to me, this is my beloved son. This is the one, not Isaac from the Old Testament. This is not the one that I spared before Abraham was going to sacrifice him. This is my son, the son of the creator. This is my beloved son, and I am pleased with him, and I want you to listen to him. Mark had to write that down. He couldn't let that go. He had to write that down so today, in 2021, you and I could hear that because once it was written, it will never end. It will never go out of Scripture until God returns in glory. He wrote that for you and me. And the church presents it during the season of Lent because in various ways, we are encouraged to do more prayer, do more fasting, do more giving to the poor. So it bothers us, so it feels uncomfortable, so we have a better hold on our bodies, on our priorities. Everybody wants to achieve and gain, and I shouldn't say everyone, but most people, that's, that's the whole reason. Kids go to school and educated hopefully to serve the community, but so often I want to make more money. I want to make more money than my father did, etc., etc. Priorities. And this act today shows where our priorities should be. As God gives us his son and says, I I'm well pleased with this guy. I, I want you to listen to him. I want you to remember when he washes the feet of his disciples. I want you to remember when he touches the leper. I want you to remember when he forgives. I want you to remember when he loses the concept of prejudice and doesn't care who he's speaking to. I want you to listen to this kid. I am well pleased with him. And so the church places that right here as we are in the second week of Lent to give us encouragement, to encourage us to come forward, to, to encourage us to, okay, we know what we're doing all year long, we know how we misguide our priorities all year long, but now we can get our priorities in gear again. Because the greatest priority is the resurrection of Jesus. But we're going toward that renewal of that day. But now, Sometimes as we give to the poor and spend more time in prayer and remember ourselves in a way that gives us dignity and we abstain from certain behaviors and certain things, now we're waiting to hear from God himself saying, these are my beloved children and they're listening to my son. That's our goal to be accepted and acknowledged by the Father because of our intimate reflection and imitation of his son, Jesus. So when Jesus is transfigured before those apostles, th think, think of the effect of it. They were able to live and die for him because he's just not another rabbi. He's not a miracle worker. He is the Son of God, acknowledged by God as his Son. They came down the mountain. They didn't quite understand what rising from the dead meant, but they knew he multiplied bread. He walked on water. He did all these terrific things. But most of all, he identified with us. He walked with you and me. And we remember it clearly as we pause and realize we're not called to imitate the suffering Jesus. We're called to imitate the resurrected Lord who suffered for you and for me. He suffered for love. He gave himself 2,000%. He gave himself forever for you and me. On the sacrifice of the cross, the mountain, Golgotha. The altar, the cross. The sacrifice, 
the Lamb of God, the Son of God, and the Father accepts him back and gives him what no person can give any of us, life eternal, resurrection. What's written centuries ago will last forever. How are we going to add to that story? How can each one of us put our own twist and addition to that story? It's going to last forever. And people will read about you in centuries to come until Jesus returns in glory. Wouldn't it be great in our prayer if we heard from God? You are my beloved daughter. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased.